A model railroad can be a fine combination of scenery, track, cars, and locomotives. But when you put a whole bunch of people in it, then it becomes a model railroad. Hi, this is Burr Stewart, and I'll be your host for a video uh, capturing about seven hours of model railroad operations that took place on my HO scale model railroad last week as part of a biannual operations weekend known as Sound Rails. To keep the video short, I'll just focus on a couple of the trains that I was able to capture with my cell phone and this overall action cam view that you're seeing here. Some of the trains, such as the Milwaukee Coast Route train, I've already covered in more detail in other videos on my channel. So I hope you'll enjoy that at some other time. Considering that we had 17 people total in the basement, uh, things went pretty well. There, there was one incident where the locomotive uh, ran into the turntable, which is something that happened on the prototype too, but uh, that was really the only accident we had all day. Okay, and you want to be lined up. Okay, I just lined you up. One of the things we wanted to do was run the Milwaukee Coast Route train, and it was staged behind the Great Northern Rock train, which you can see starting to pull out on the right-hand side there. This is a fictitious gravel train which served some of the cement plants in the area. We had so many operators in the room that we could run whatever train we wanted, and we did. The gentleman with the British accent was our dispatcher for the day and he was also wearing an orange shirt. So you'll see him running around during this video, giving people track clearances and uh, generally managing the operation. That's me in the Navy cap, just sort of wandering around, managing by walking around, I guess. Meanwhile, our rock train is starting to climb out of the Bellingham staging yard and down onto what we fondly refer to as the Skulls Bridge, named after a module of beautiful scenery that was built by the late Paul Skulls for his book, Building Realistic Scenery. You'll notice how slowly this rock train is progressing. This is typical of a model railroad operating session. The slower that you run the trains, the safer it is for everyone, the more time people have to figure out what they're supposed to be doing, and the more realistic it looks. The inset here shows the front end of our train going across the Skulls Bridge, while the rear end is still coming out of the Bellingham staging yard. The rock train out of the way. We were then able to run the Milwaukee Coast train down from Bellingham all the way to Seattle. The only reason that locomotive doesn't have a headlight is because it, the bulb burned out and I haven't gotten around to replacing it yet. Sorry about that.
At least the rotating beacon still works. This model railroad is set in 1973 in the Seattle region, and this was a pretty exciting time for the Milwaukee Road, which, uh, while otherwise approaching its bankruptcy in 1980, was able to take advantage of the fact that the Burlington Northern merger in 1970 had granted the Milwaukee trackage rights down from Seattle to Portland. And this allowed the Southern Pacific Railroad to route their traffic on the Milwaukee instead of the Burlington Northern in order to increase um, the amount of track uh, that it was able to collect uh, revenue from. So you'll see on the Milwaukee train there are a certain number of Southern Pacific cars that are there just for that reason. Also, I don't think I'm technically correct. They shut down, the, the Milwaukee Road shut down the Pacific Extension in 1980, but I'm not sure what year they actually went bankrupt and disappeared as a company. Well, the next exciting thing that happened in the operating session was that all these trains converged in Everett, and we had a northbound through freight moving from Seattle to Vancouver opposite a, uh, the Rock Train and the Milwaukee Coast Train. And you'll see now some footage of us trying to get these three trains past each other. And you can see me there with my cell phone trying to capture it on film. I will give the Rock Train clearance uh, as soon as the main line is clear of uh, this. That strange stump load uh, has a long story behind it, but anyway, it's helpful for identifying a specific train when you have that unusual load. That will come up in a few minutes in some other footage we have. Are you going to end up coming to Bomber Yard here and then going all the way to staging, which is way buried underneath that hill over there? You have done a complete loop around the layout several times. I don't know if this is going to work or not. Well, okay. You may have to underlay at that end. This is going to be like a saw by. Because you're not going to clear the back end of the siding. It wasn't that the northbound through was too long for the siding. It was that the siding had some other cars in it. So the only way that the Yardmaster could expedite this move was to do a saw-by where he pulled the cars back far enough to allow the two shorter trains to come in the opposite direction. It's actually harder to explain than it is to carry it out. So now you can see the nose of the rock train just peeking into the picture on the left there. This is what we call excitement in a model railroad operating session. 
Behind the rock train is the Milwaukee Coast Train. So the only way that the Milwaukee Coast Train can get through on this main line here is for the Bellingham train with the red caboose to back up after the rock train has passed, allowing the Milwaukee train to come in, and then shoving forward another time in order to uh, allow the Milwaukee train to pass. This sawing back and forth is why this maneuver is called the saw by. You can see I'm not the only one excited by the action here. I really like the look of these short hopper cars. Often they're called ore jennies. They were originally built for use in the iron ore hauling business in Michigan and Minnesota, but by the 1970s they were being used for all sorts of miscellaneous bulk handling jobs like the limestone you're seeing here. And we also uh, have more cars like this hauling uh, copper ore down from British Columbia to the smelter in Tacoma that was operated by a company called Asarco. Well, now that the rock train has cleared the switch, I would expect that these gentlemen will start backing the train so that they can let the Milwaukee Coast Route come through. There they go. That upper deck you see is the termination for the narrow gauge branch on the layout. But we'll be operating that some other day, I think. Well, a few minutes later, as advertised, here is the Milwaukee Coast Route train making the same maneuver the rock train did. And here is the northbound through train heading up towards Bellingham. There's that signature stump load I was talking about. Meanwhile, with this many people in the room, there's all kinds of other stuff going on. This is a Union Pacific transfer that's come into town. And here is the rock train southbound through Seattle, uh, about to pass the uh, Union Pacific train. It looks like the UP train is switching in the cement plant, which is why it's uh, backing into the spur there.
This is one of my favorite things in model railroading when you have two trains going the same direction on different tracks. Cool. Meanwhile, on the upper deck, the International is making its way from Seattle up to Vancouver, British Columbia. This was a daily or twice daily passenger train. It was run by Amtrak by 1973, but they still used BN engines. Having waited in the siding at Burlington for the International to pass it, our northbound through freight is now moving across the Skulls Bridge, which we call the Samish River, and heading towards the Bellingham Staging Yard. There's that funky stump load again. See that load of sheet steel on the flat car? We're back in the inner bay yard, also called Balmer, and where you see that bright yellow Milwaukee hopper in the background, that's eventually going to be a model of Subota Steel, which was a local steel fabrication company in Seattle. And that flat car load full of steel needs to be spotted there. Good. And he doesn't have anything, he doesn't have anything. So you have to just put Well, a few minutes or maybe oh, hours like later, and we have a southbound through freight coming from Bellingham down to Seattle along the coast so you route. You go around there and coordinate with him. The yard in the left there is the Delta Yard, and the two engines up there are the Sky Local, which is working the local switching all up and down the coast. This through freight is full of lumber from British Columbia coming down to build homes with all over the United States. <laughs> These tank cars are at a loading dock where kerosene was transloaded and taken up to the two major if Air Force bases in the Seattle area, Fairchild in Spokane, and McCord Air Force Base in Tacoma. These southbound freights from Vancouver, BC, always used four axle diesels because there was a tax on a per axle basis so if they ran six axle diesels they had to pay more to cross the border. So anytime you see a train being pulled by six axle diesels on this railroad it's either headed east or south. This section of double track on the shore of Puget Sound was effectively the main line between Seattle and Chicago. And it was very subject to landslides from this steep hill. Now one of the things I plan to do someday is make a little model of a landslide and then during an operating session we can have one of the two mains out of service and have to route trains around it. Oh look, there's some of that copper ore that I was talking about in the, in the hopper cars. In later years those were hauled in uh, covered, short, stubby covered hoppers. 
This is just a good overview of the room showing how crowded it was and how much fun everyone was having. And I forgot to say, when you leave here, eventually use main two, the far track to go around. I think we get into Delta. Okay. It appears that the southbound oh, yeah, through freight from Vancouver, BC has arrived in Seattle's Inner Bay Yard. And this is the three engines that were on that train, and they're proceeding to double over to the other main track and put them back in the engine house. It looks like somebody else is waiting to get into the yard. This Burlington Jeep hasn't been renumbered yet. It's still got its old locomotive number. But quite a few of the locomotives now do. For example, this 1361 Great Northern, uh, that's the BN number for it. It takes me a while to get all this renumbering done. Back on the other side of the room, the unit grain train is pulling out. And on the upper track there, the northbound freight is moving up towards Burlington on its way to Bellingham. This bridge crossing is called the Stillaguamish River. That yellow unit in between the two SD40-2s is an ALCO C636 from the Spokane, Portland, and Seattle Railway, which merged into the BN in 1970. Well, now our unit grain train is heading north through the Stacy Street Yard in South Seattle, past the Milwaukee car barge, and the King Street Station on the background there, and into the tunnel under downtown Seattle. You can see going the other direction, the Empire Builder passenger train has just arrived and is dropping off its passengers there at the King Street Station. I don't have room for a model of the King Street Station, but I sure could improve that backdrop.
In the back there, you can see the grain train is taking a crossover between Main 2 and Main 1 in order to get around that passenger train that stopped at the King Street Station. As the layout owner, this is very gratifying for me to see because I probably installed that crossover 20 years ago and it's only used in situations like this where we have high traffic volume and trains need to move around. Now our grain train's uh, pulling by what looks to be a caboose hop uh, past downtown Seattle and approaching the Inner Bay Yard. As you may have figured out, the caboose hop is stalled on the main there because it's waiting for the passenger train to get out of the way at King Street Station. Meanwhile, the jet job is running from the Boeing plant at Payne Field up to the Everett's Bayside Yard in order to distribute the empty car parts, box cars and flat cars, to destinations all over the country and in Canada. This train ran caboose first from Mukilteo up to Everett. It's only about six miles, I think. At some point, we'll have a sound car in this caboose, so we'll be able to blow for grade crossings, since they always had a conductor there uh, facing forward to protect the train. There's a separate video on my YouTube channel that covers the operation of the jet job, uh, which I recommend. Conductor standing on the rear platform with the with the, with the whistle handle in his, in his own. This locomotive that was used for the jet job was a specially equipped GP9, which was modified so that it would work on the severe 5% grades on the branch line uh, that went up to the Boeing aircraft manufacturing plant. A few minutes later, the jet job enters the Bayside Yard in Everett, caboose first. No idea what that sound was, but there it is. So you've gotten this far in the video, you might as well watch at least one actual operation. So what's going to happen here, the jet job operator is going to drop off their caboose on the very right hand track of Bayside Yard there. And then he's going to pull back and stick the rest of his cars uh, on the yard track one for the Bayside Yard Master to process and then he'll be able to pull his engine off. At that point his train would be considered terminated and he can go off duty and get a different job. Meanwhile the Bayside Yard Master will process the cars, make up an outgoing jet job, and when he's got it ready call for a crew. <laughs> Multiply that by the 17 people in the room, seven hours, and you get a really fun time head by all.
Um, push that through. Alright, let me take that one car out for you. Where do you want it? On the main? Uh, where do you want it? On the main? Uh, I mean, I can pull the whole string. I can pull the whole string out to the crossover if you want. The whole string? It, it's halfway in the. It's in the middle of a cut. <laughs> okay. Well, if one if one car is buried. Or we'll push it up very fast and just push it up against. Or yeah, or uh, I can pull it up if you want to grab it through the crossover. It's up to you. In the foreground, you can hear all of the back and forth negotiations between the assistant yard master and Interbay and uh, various train crews going through. You might be wondering where the Bayside Yardmaster is all this time with the uh, jet job there and all those empty tracks. The, the answer is the Bayside Yardmaster and the Delta Yardmaster, both in Everett, have been working together the whole day uh, to optimize the use of both yards. And at the moment, both of them are over on the right-hand side of the video in the Delta yard trying to help a through train uh, pick up some extra cars. And y you can see that maneuver a little bit in the upper right-hand okay. corner. Bird just told me that that is a car for you. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. You're a fern, a fern turn, right? Yep. It says they be a fern turn. The Fern Turn they're talking about is a local train that was called the Ferndale Local. And uh, there's a separate video on my channel about that train as well. The Fern Turn handled aluminum ingots from the Alcoa plant, so that's why they needed double door boxcars. Well, with that, I think we're going to wrap it up with uh, one last shot of our unit grain train heading north along the coastline between Seattle and Everett, Washington. Moving northerly like this, the train was likely to be empties heading back to the Midwest to pick up more grain. They would go north to Everett and then head east over Stevens Pass. The loaded inbound grain trains would generally come along the old SPNS route down the Columbia River and up from Portland to Seattle. The truth is that the prototype often ran the empty grain cars back in regular manifest trains, but we sometimes stretch the truth in model railroad operating sessions just because we like to see certain things like unit grain trains. Sorry about that. Of course, well, another advantage of modeling 1973 is that all the trains still had cabooses at that time. So I guess that's an appropriate way to bring this video to a close. I hope you've enjoyed this and learned something a little bit about model railroad operations. And we'll see you soon in another video or operating session somewhere soon. In the meantime, this is Burr Stewart wishing you much fun with trains.